Welcome back to Harbour Unbox. Now, it's been 10 years, actually almost 11 years now, since Intel released its first quad-core desktop CPU, the glued together Core 2 Quad Q6600, and what a glorious CPU it was. The 65 nanometer quad core operated at 2.4 gigahertz, but back then boost clocks weren't a thing and CPUs operated on a front side bus. We've seen eight major architectural updates and four die shrinks spanning a decade, and yet in all that time, Intel only offers up to a quad core for its mainstream product lines, latest of which is the KB Lake based Core i7 7700K, which was released back in January of this year for $340 US. However, shortly after that, AMD did something that we'd all hoped they'd do, but certainly weren't convinced they could, or at least I wasn't convinced they could. And that, of course, was to release a CPU architecture that was good really good. Uh, Ryzen certainly disrupted Intel's business as usual type attitude and it's been fireworks ever since. In a nutshell, AMD hit Intel the hardest by offering more cores for less money. That was kind of the strategy with Bulldozer, but the key ingredient here being that the cores didn't completely suck. IPC performance is slightly down on Intel's latest and greatest offerings, but there really isn't that much in it and Ryzen's efficiency certainly is very good, so they're not really giving up anything there. Actually, the biggest advantage Intel has right now is their superior clock speeds, and this is something AMD hopes to address next year. Before AMD can do that though, Intel's hitting back with their 8th generation core series, and with that they're addressing one of Ryzen's biggest advantages, cores. Lots of cores. Although Ryzen 7 will still have a core count advantage, Intel is now making 6 cores the standard for their high-end parts. The new Core i5 and Core i7 processors now pack 6 cores, and that's going to have a very big impact. On hand today, we have the flagship model, the Core i7 8700K, which is based on Intel's latest architecture, codenamed Coffee Lake. I also have the Core i5 8400, but I'll be focusing on that CPU in another video shortly. Unfortunately, at this time though, I don't actually have the Core i5 8600K, so the unlocked Core i5, but I will get my hands on one of those shortly, as well as the Core i3 models. Anyway, for now, the focus is on the big guy, the 6-core, 12-thread monster, known as the 8700K. Designed to operate no slower than 3.7 GHz, it will boost a single core as high as 4.7 GHz, and under full load should maintain an operating frequency of 4.3 GHz. Each of the six cores feature a 256 KB level 2 cache, while there is a much larger 12 MB level 3 cache. Intel has given the chip a 95 watt TDP rating, and once again they are using the LGA 1151 socket, though this can be considered as like a version 2, as it will be an no way compatible with the previous KB Lake or Skylake CPUs. Now the price has been increased from the 7700K as the 8700K comes in at a rather steep $360 US and that is a $20 price hike from the KB Lake flagship part. It's also $60 more than AMD's Ryzen 7 17700 and that's the company's cheapest Ryzen 7 part and it is of course unlocked. The 1700X is also priced at $360 but smart shoppers will opt for the cheaper non-X model. I've personally had just as much luck overclocking both the X and non-X models to 4 GHz. Moving on, it's great to see that unlike the high-end desktop Skylake X parts on the LGA 2066 socket, the new Coffee Lake CPUs still use the ring bus and not the mesh interconnect method which is used by the higher core count parts. This is great news because it means the 8700K will maintain the 7700K's gaming prowess and should be in fact able to take things to the next level for gamers. So without wasting any more time, let's see how this thing handles. Jumping into the benchmarks, let's first take a look at memory bandwidth performance. Please note all CPUs were tested using DDR4-3200-CL14 memory. That in mind, it's interesting to note that the Core i7-8700K does take a step forward from the 7700K is now on par with the Ryzen 5 CPUs with around 36 gigabytes per second of memory bandwidth. That said though, it's still trailing the Ryzen 7 models by around 2 gigabytes per second. Okay, so let's check out the Cinebench R15 scores. As luck would have it, after a three-run average, the 8700K matched the R7-1700 with a multi-threaded score of 1,423 points. That did mean it was 13% slower than the 1800X, but still an impressive result all the same. Actually, what's really impressive here is the single-core score, and this explains how a six-core Intel CPU kept pace with an eight-core AMD CPU. The 8700K provides the same 195-point single-thread score as the 7700 k and by extension the 7740X. So the 8700K is looking pretty solid all round. It also completely dusts the Core i7-700X as well, so kind of sucks if you bought one of those recently. 
Moving on, we have PC Mark 10, and this gives us a look at how these CPUs compare in more general use case scenarios. Core count isn't that important for the most part here, it's really all about the frequency. For that reason, the Core i7-8700K does extremely well, outscoring the 7700K by a 5% margin. Excel is an office type benchmark which can utilize many threads, especially when running the Extreme Monte Carlo simulation. The 8700K finds itself situated between the Ryzen 7 1700 and the 1800X with a completion time of 2.55 seconds. This also makes it around 13% faster than the Core i7 7800X, another 6 core Intel CPU. Testing with Veracrypt, we see that this time the 8700K trails the Ryzen 7 1700, though it is still around 10% faster than the Core i7-7800X, and 14% faster than AMD's 6-core R5-1600. Then moving on, we have non-encrypted compression and decompression performance using 7-Zip. Whereas hyperthreading sees a similar level of efficiency when compressing and decompressing, SMT is significantly more efficient for the decompression work. Here we see that the 8700K does very well, and it's around 50% faster than the 7700K. Handbrake is a popular application for encoding, and we've used it to convert a 4K H.264 video to 1080p using H.265, and then recorded the average frame rate. Here the Ryzen 7 1700 sped out 11 frames per second on average, while the 1800X managed 12.6 frames per second. Not bad, but the new Core i7-8700K went complete beast mode with an average of 13.8 frames per second, making it 10% faster than the 1800X and 11% faster than the 7800X. Next up we have Premiere, and we know this application likes cores, but it also loves clock speed. The new Core i7-8700K completed the encode in 195 seconds, which is just a few seconds slower than the Ryzen 7 1800X, so a very impressive result for the Core i7 CPU here. Moving on to some rendering tests, we have Blender, and first up we're running the Ryzen Graphic 27 test. Once again, the 8700K finds itself in a Ryzen 7 sandwich with a completion time of 25.8 seconds. This made it almost 40% faster than the Core i7-7700K and Ryzen 5 1600 in this test. The Gooseberry workload paints somewhat of a different picture. In this extreme workload, the 8700K is able to pull ahead of the Ryzen 7 1800X and is now 14% faster and 8% faster than the 7800X. Corona comes as a standalone benchmark. It renders a fixed scene six times and we take the time it takes to complete the entire task. This time the 8700K is closer to the R7-1700 than it is the 1800X, but even so a render time of just 142 seconds for a 6 core CPU is mighty impressive. Povray is another ray tracer. It's been around for many years and we're using the official benchmark. Again, the 8700K is closer to the R7-1700 than it is the 1800X, but even so, it's a good bit faster than the now redundant 7800X. Alright, so time for a few quick gaming benchmarks before we look at the power consumption and temperatures. Here we're testing Battlefield 1 using the DirectX 12 API with the ultra quality preset enabled. All the games have been tested using the GTX 1080 Ti and Vega 64 GPUs, and first up we have the GeForce results. Even with the GTX 1080 Ti at 1080p, we are GPU limited in Battlefield 1 using the ultra quality settings. For this reason, the 8700K is limited to the same 157 FPS as the 7700K. The Ryzen CPUs meanwhile look quite a bit slower despite delivering over 100 FPS at all times. That said, it is worth noting that there can be an issue with the Ryzen CPUs when using an Nvidia GPU in DirectX 12 titles, so let's check out the Vega 64 results. Although we are slightly more GPU bound here with the slower Vega 64 GPU, what's key to note here is that while the 8700K and 7700K frame rates are slightly reduced, the Ryzen CPUs see a rather significant boost in frame rate. They are of course still slower than the Intel CPUs, but the margin is significantly reduced. We'll take a look at this again in a moment while trying to remove the GPU bottleneck. Next up we have Ashes of the Singularity, and here the Core i7-8700K really shows what it can do, as it roughly matches the Core i7-7820X and Threadripper 1920X in this core heavy game. The average frame rate was boosted by 17% over the 7700K, and 25% over the Ryzen 7 1700. Swapping out the GTX 1080 Ti for Vega 64 actually helps put the 8700K ahead of the Threadripper CPU, though with that exception the rest of the margins are really much the same. Moving on to Civilization 6, we see that the Core i7-8700K is roughly on par with the 7700K as well as AMD's Ryzen 7 1800X, and this is with the GeForce GTX 1080 Ti. So some pretty competitive looking results here. 
Please note that in my Intel Core i9-7980XE and 7960X review, the Ryzen 7 frame rates were higher than what's shown here. I wasn't able to determine if this was a mistake made on my behalf or if it was down to a game patch or driver update. Previously, the 1800X was pushing 112 FPS on average with Vega 64, and now we're down to 100 FPS. I'm constantly retesting, and sometimes we do find a change like this in some games. Mafia 3, for example, was dropped from the testing, as the performance often changed quite dramatically with each update. Anyway, it's worth noting that we are still seeing vastly superior performance on the Ryzen 7 CPUs with Vega 64. It's just not as extreme as I showed previously. Whereas the 8700K was 4% faster with Vega 64 compared to the GTX 1080Ti, the 1800X is almost 20% faster, so Civilization still providing some very interesting results when comparing the GeForce and Radeon GPUs using the DirectX 12 API. The last game we're going to look at is F1 2017, and first up we have the GTX 1080 Ti results. Here the 8700K was actually slower than the 7700K, which is a bit odd. It seems this title can get a bit confused when there are more than four cores on offer. That said though, the 7700K is clearly faster than the 7600K, and this is the same case when looking at the Ryzen 5 1600 and 1500X. Even with Vega 64, we find much the same between the 7700K and 8700K, though there is a bit of reshuffling in the midfield, and it is the Skylake X parts that seem to lose out the most here. Overall, though, the 8700K was slightly slower than the 7700K in this title. Okay, so before wrapping up the gaming, let's just quickly retest Battlefield 1 at the ultra-low 720p resolution to try and remove the GPU bottleneck while still maintaining the ultra-quality settings. Previously, the 8700K was only able to match the 7700K and wasn't much faster than the 7600K. However, by removing the GPU bottleneck, we run into another issue, Battlefield 1's 200fps hard cap. The 8700K was able to keep the GTX 1080 Ti at 200 FPS for the majority of our test, and this means it could be much faster than the 10% margin we see here over the 7700K. It's now 27% faster than the 7600K and 55% faster than the Ryzen 7 1800X. Although the Ryzen 7 1800 looked, uh, how should I say it, almost pathetic with the GTX 1080 Ti, it's a bit of a different story with Vega 64. Here it's 20% slower than the 8700K, and while that's still a fair old margin, it is much better than what we saw previously with the GTX 1080 Ti. The 7700K is also quite a bit faster than the Radeon graphics card as well, but unfortunately the 8700K is again limited by the game's artificial frame cap. Anyway, one thing's for sure, the 8700K is an incredibly powerful gaming CPU. Next up we have power consumption. It's important to measure using software that stresses all cores. I found that Corona works very well for providing accurate results, so these load figures are based on the Corona benchmark after a single pass, and I'm reporting the maximum logged result. This is total system draw, and I'm using the Kabak PowerMate to measure from the wall. When it comes to power draw, the Core i7-8700K is certainly on the higher side, but it's not as extreme as what we saw from the Skylake X CPUs. The 7800X, for example, was not only slower in every single test, but it also pushed total system draw 17% higher. When compared to the Ryzen 7 1800X, the 8700K did increase system consumption by 18%, so Intel isn't quite as efficient as they have had to increase frequency quite aggressively in order to keep pace with AMD's 8-core Ryzen 7 processors. Still, overall, I'm impressed with what Intel's been able to achieve here. The 8700K certainly looks very solid all around. Now, I'm very keen to see how the thing overclocks. If you deleted your 7700K, you could probably get about 5 GHz out of it, maybe 5.1 GHz. With very little effort, we managed to push my 8700K chip to 5.2 GHz, and here it was 100% stable. I could even boot into Windows at 5.3 GHz and run a few tests, but it will require finer voltage tuning for 100% stability. We didn't really have too much time to play around with overclocking just yet, so I settled on 5.2 GHz. I felt like that was probably impressive enough as it was. This impressive overclock also means that the 8700K is now able to match the multi-core score of the 1800X in Cinebench R15 while devastating the single thread result. That said, you can of course overclock the 1800X and that does allow it to remain ahead for the productivity workloads. Speaking of which, this is how the overclocks change the Corona results. Overclocking the 8700K meant that it was able to complete this task 15% faster than its out-of-the-box configuration. That said though, the 1800X did see a 20% improvement once overclocked. The Ryzen 7 1800 overclock increased system power draw by a whopping 42%, and this was the exact same figure seen when overclocking the 8700K as well. Neither provided anywhere near that kind of performance gain, so as usual, the efficiency kind of goes out the window once you overclock. 
I haven't had a chance to build my new Core i7 8700K test system yet, but you can bet I will be doing that over the next few days or so, and it will become my new GPU testing machine. For now though, I'm using the Deepcool Captain 240EX RGB. It's an all-in-one liquid cooler with a 240mm radiator. It's a decent solution, though the Noctua NHD15 air cooler has been reported to deliver slightly better temperatures on an overclock 7700K, for example. That said, the D15 is about as good as air coolers get. Anyway, with a room temperature of 21 degrees, the 8700K idled at just 25 degrees. When stressing both the CPU and FPU, temperatures did hit 84 degrees. Meanwhile, just stressing the CPU saw temps max out at 60 degrees. Then once overclocked to 5.2 gigahertz running the CPU stress test, we did get within six degrees of the TJ Maxx, peaking at 97 degrees briefly. Obviously a D-lid would really help tremendously here for those seeking more extreme overclocks and a more extreme cooling solution probably wouldn't hurt either. Intel's made some pretty big performance claims when it comes to the 8th generation core series, but with 50% more cores on the Core i5 and Core i7 parts, claiming up to 25% more frames in games isn't that bold. That said though, are these gains just down to the added cores, or are there some architectural improvements made here to increase the IPC? Some sources have suggested up to a 10% increase in IPC, so let's look into that. What I've done for this test is lock the 8700K and 7700K at 4.5 GHz. I've also disabled two of the 8700K's cores, essentially mimicking the configuration of the 7700K. First up, we have Cinebench R15. As you can plainly see, the four core and eight threads clocked at 4.5 GHz, just like we have with the 7700K. The 8700K delivers basically the same scores. After a three run average, it was slightly slower in the multi-threaded test. As expected, that almost 50% increase in score comes from a 50% increase in cores. Testing with Corona, we again see that the 7700K is slightly faster than the 8700K when they are both matched with the same core and thread count at 4.5 GHz. Again, adding two more cores makes the 8700K almost 50% faster. And finally, power consumption. This is an interesting one. The 8700K does pack 50% more level three cache to support those extra cores. And this isn't something we can disable when turning off those cores. So here we see that when comparing the four core eight thread configurations, the 8700K does push system consumption 10% higher at the same clock speed. Then with those extra cores enabled, the total system draw is increased by 33%. Okay, before we wrap this review up, we should probably check out a few price versus performance scatter plots to work out just how well the 8700K stacks up in terms of value. Looking at the Premiere Pro CC results, we see that the Core i7-8700K is a good step forward from the recently released 7800X. It's both faster and cheaper. Compared to the Ryzen 7 1700, the 8700K was 8% faster, but it also cost 20% more. Still, it is much better value than the R7-1800X. Overclocking does muddy the water a bit here, so we're not going to focus on that for this review. I'll cover the overclocking stuff in a bit more detail in a future video. For now, the R7-1700 looks to provide content creators with the best value option, but the Core i7-8700K is certainly a viable option, and I didn't feel this was the case with the 700X, for example. For the Extreme Blender workload, the 8700K does very well. Again, it's 20% more costly than the R7-1700, but it's also 20% faster out of the box. In terms of value, the R5-1600 is still the best option, but for it to get anywhere near the stock 8700K, you'd have to overclock it to at least 4 gigahertz. So Intel puts forth an extremely compelling option here. For gamers, especially high refresh rate gaming, it's pretty obvious that Intel CPUs are the way to go in terms of performance and value. As we saw with the 720p results, the 8700K was GPU limited at 1080p. I snuck in the 720p testing last minute as I finished up this review, so I don't have any price versus performance scatter plot stuff for that, but needless to say, Intel wins quite comfortably here. Using Vega 64, we are again GPU limited, though it has to be said the Ryzen CPUs perform much better with a Radeon GPU when using the DirectX 12 API. So for gamers hoping to maximize their dollar, the Ryzen 5 1600 still presents a great value option and is arguably the most cost-effective choice for anyone who isn't after extreme high refresh rate type gaming. Finally, when looking at the Ashes of the Singularity results with Vega 64, we again see an extremely impressive result from the 8700K, and it's a good bit faster than the previous gaming king, the 7700K. These figures also really suggest to me that the 8700K isn't just the new king of gaming right now, but it also will be well into the future. Well, there you have it, Intel's new mainstream flagship Core i7 processor, and what a beast it is. For gamers seeking the ultimate gaming experience, there simply is nothing better than the Core i7-8700K right now. It really has no weakness. Out of the box, the performance was incredible. Overclocking is probably even more incredible, and power consumption really was impressive for a CPU running at well over 4GHz out of the box. 
and for all those reasons, it's certainly going to find its way into my new gaming rig. Speaking of which, I will be using the new MSI Z370 Godlike, and that board, the board here to my left, was used for all the testing in this video, and it did enable that impressive 5.2 GHz overclock. I'm also keen to see how much further I can push the 8700K once I do build my new system, so a little bit more tinkering to be done there, but it should be a bit of fun. The only slight downer is, of course, the price, and I'm not talking about the Godlike, though that is a ridiculously expensive motherboard. I believe it's about 700 Australian dollars, so... Yeah, it's the cream of the crop MSI say. Anyway, as for the 8700K at $360 US, it is a little bit more expensive than the 7700K, the CPU it's replacing, but make no mistake, the 8700K is a serious step up from the 7700K, but at the same time, it's also a bit of a costly affair, uh, particularly when compared to something like the Ryzen 5 1600, for example. I feel the majority of gamers will be better served by the R5 1600 though. Having said that, I'm yet to check out the Coffee Lake Core i5 range and I'll be doing that very shortly. Still, the 8700K really only makes sense for those after extreme frame rates with the latest and greatest gaming hardware, or those playing CSGO at 720p using low quality settings on a GTX 1060. Anyway, as I said, all this frame rate madness isn't cheap. Once you dish out $306 for the 8700K, you really want to spend at least another $100 or so on a decent cooler. Realistically, you could spend as little as $20 on a basic air cooler, but I feel like that's doing this incredible overclocker a disservice. Anyway, let's say $20 to be conservative. Now we're at $400, and then once you factor in a decent Z370 board for, say, around $150, you now have a $550 combo. Moving on from gaming though, what about productivity? Well, the Core i7-8700K has the Ryzen 7 1800X beat quite convincingly. It almost wasn't a contest. That said, the 1800X was already a dead chip in RIs before the 8700K even came along. Compared to the R7-1700, the 8700K is at best on par in terms of value, but with both overclocked to the max, the Ryzen 7 CPU should offer a little more. Even so, it will vary from one application to the next, and I'd say overall they are very similar. Again, though, those on a budget will opt for Ryzen as it is cheaper and it will deliver a similar level of performance without much trouble. Still, the 8700K really has proven to be much more of an all-rounder, certainly much more so than the 7700K was. Therefore, overall, I really like Intel's new Core i7 8700K and I can't wait to check out the rest of the Coffee Lake range. 2017 has already proven to be an absolutely spectacular year for PC hardware, and it's great to see so many impressive options available to consumers. With that, I hope you guys enjoyed the review. I'm your host, Steve. See you again soon.